So before I entered seminary, I did a couple of years in UCC, and um, generally speaking, I try to be on time, but you know, I mean, like, I, I, I would have things to do. So I was particularly, I was a little late for this one particular lecture. So I was scooting into the lecture, trying to be as, as quiet and as subtle as possible. And um, the lecture has long, the lecture theater, the Boole, Boole one or two, whatever, whichever one it was, uh, it's got these long rows. So it's kind of hard, it's like, like in the cinema. It's kind of hard to get in subtly because you have to, excuse me, sorry, sorry, you just scoot along and everyone has to kind of shove their knees to the left or to the right so you can scoot in because I saw my friends were right in the middle, obviously. So sorry, excuse me, sorry, excuse me. And I scooted the whole way in to go out my bag, to go out my notebook, to go out my red pen for the titles and my blue pen for the notes, sat down, looked up, all ready to go and realized the whole lecture theater is looking at me. And then I just heard the question, what do you think, sir? And that was the lecturer addressing me, because apparently he had been giving out to me for the last 90 seconds about being late, and I hadn't heard a word of it. Uh, so I'm just sitting there going, uh, could, could, you re could, you, could you repeat the question, um, sir? <laughs> So it was about being tired, and if I, if I feel, you know, do you feel it's acceptable to be three minutes late? No, no, it's un unacceptable, it's, un un it's terrible, unacceptable, I will never do that again. <laughs> anyway, so speaking of not listening, you all picked up the first reading, didn't you? You all got that, didn't you? You all got the reading? Good, excellent, fantastic. So what was the reading about? <laughs> Excellent, good, good, and, and then? And then what <laughs> happened? So, Moses on Sinai gets the Ten Commandments, okay? Moses come down, comes down from Mount Sinai, and what does he discover? That the people below were dancing and chanting, <laughs> right? Otherwise known as dancing and chanting, uh, right? So they were celebrating, what were they celebrating? Lads, come on, you got this. Someone, someone, you got this. What were they celebrating? Um, they, were, they were celebrating idolatry. What, sorry? False, idol. False idols, very good. Idols, they were celebrating idolatry. So they got bored while Moses was gone up in the mountain talking to God. They got, they got impatient. And so they decided that they would fashion themselves something to adore in the meantime. Right, so they, they gather up the gold, they, they, they smelt it down, and they, 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 they make a calf, a golden calf. This is what they would have been familiar with while they were slaves in Egypt. Right? They would have adored calves there too. So basically they, they fell into a, a practice that wasn't a Jewish practice. They fell into idolatry. So to make an idol of something, to make God something. And our Sam actually, this is, this is biblical humor, maybe you missed it. Did you miss the biblical humor? Maybe you did. Um, but it said here, they fashioned a calf at Horeb uh, and worshipped an image of metal, exchanging the God who was their glory for the image of a bull that eats grass. Did you? Maybe you didn't. Okay. I just find that. That's just kind of, okay, it's biblical humor. It's, it's, it's a long time ago. Uh, so, but this is, the, this is the idea, right? Like they, they had a God of glory, a God who freed them, right, from Egypt. Right? Freed them with pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, splitting the Red Sea, manna appearing magically on the ground, and quail, and everything they needed. Water from the rock. And instead of worshipping this God who is their glory, they worship a cow who eats grass. You know, I mean, it's like the, the, he's really trying to get, a, get across the point, right? And so actually, it, it wasn't even a cow. It was the, at least a cow, you get something from it. This is the image of a cow, right? It's metal. You get nothing from it, not even milk, right? It's just pure useless. But they made it themselves, and they worshipped it. Now, that's the definition of stupid, <laughs> right? It's just absolutely crazy that you would worship something that you made yourself. I mean, imagine like sitting down, right? You get your Lego and you make up something and go, this is God. No, you, no it's plastic and, 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 and you just made it. So if you just made God, what does that make you? I'm a God maker. <laughs> it makes you God. If you can make God, it makes you God, Right? And that, again, that's the essence of insanity, because you know you're not God. If you were God, 
You can make these puppies twice as big as they are without even working out. But you're not. You can't. You're not God. Sorry if that bursts anyone's bubble here, but like, you, you did know that, didn't you? You know you're not God. You're not God. Okay, so God, because God is way bigger than you and way older uh, and eternal and almighty, and you're not. So this is a good thing. It's a good thing to recognize that God is like infinitely more than us, infinitely greater than us. And so at times, there's always a danger that if we get bored of waiting for God, that we'll put something else in his place. If we get bored, if we get impatient of waiting for God, we'll put something else in his place. Now, most people don't sit down and say, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create myself an idol, and I'm going to worship that instead of God. No one really does that. That's, that would be exceptionally rare. So how do we know if we have idols in our lives? It's not generally because we're going to have a Buddha statue or something in our room. That might be the case also, but generally speaking, it doesn't happen so visibly. How do we know if we put something else in God's place? How do we know practically? Okay, I've, given, I've given us a bit of time. I've given you no time to think this over. Otherwise, I know I, I, that there would be a rush of answers, but I know I've, I've jumped this on you. I was just thinking earlier, how do we know if we put something else in God's place? I think this is a simple enough answer, to be honest. Wherever we put our time, wherever we put our time, that's where our heart is. Wherever we put our time. Because our time, our time is precious. Our time is limited. So if, I, if, if all of my time, if all of my time is going into sport, sport is a good thing. But if all of my time and free time and thoughts and desires and hopes and dreams and everything goes into that, now I've gone too far. I'm after putting recreation, something which should be on the kind of the periphery of my life, like lots of balanced things. I should read and I should do sport and I should spend time with friends and I should spend time with family and I should spend time alone. All these things in balance. If all of my time, effort and energy goes into any one thing, there's a real danger that that actually becomes an idol. That becomes the central thing. That becomes my, my everything. And that can be anything, to be honest. It can be a, a relationship. It can be exams. It can be looking good. It can be looking buff. It can be, uh, say, sports. Uh, it, can be, it can be anything at all. Just, it can often even be yourself. I put myself at the center of my life. Everyone should know me and respect me. That's all I want. I will do everything and anything to get that. Then very subtly, these things can actually become central in my life. So now everything has to serve that. So say, I mean, if, if it's, I remember I was talking to um, uh, a priest from, from Austria once, and he was talking, the, the Winter Olympics are very, very big there. Winter Olympics aren't very big here because we don't have snow. Um, but uh, he was talking about a, uh, you know, have you ever seen cross-country skiing? Yeah? yeah. No? Have you... you can nod. Have you ever seen? You've never seen cross-country skiing? Cross-country skiing is absolutely mental because you can ski slowly uphill, right? It's crazy, but it takes absolutely every single muscle in your body because you've got your two poles and you stamp them in and you just kind of ski off that way and then the, the skis have kind of, yeah, they don't ski backwards, so they kind of lock and then you stamp about this way and stamp and you burn billions of calories like in, in, in their races. They, they, do, they do a kind of a, a, a circuit and it's absolutely, ex it's grueling, absolutely exhausting because arms and legs, everything, everything. And the guys, like, they, have, they have legs like cyclists but they also have to be strong up top, you know, because it's just absolutely, they're as fit. Anyway. And uh, so for the Olympics then, like, you know, you're training for four years to get there. And this priest was talking to someone who, who competes uh, in that. And, and he said, what, what is it like? And he said, you can't have anything else in your life. You can't have anything else in your life. As in girlfriend, family, th there is no time because there'll always be someone. There'll be some Russian. There'll be some Swede willing to go the extra 2%. And that's 20 meters in front of you that you just cannot make up. You just can't, you just can't catch him. So there'll always be someone willing to do that bit more. So he said for, for those four years, or maybe it could be eight years, it could be 12 years of practice beforehand, you can have nothing else in your life. It's 
dangerous, like it's really, really dangerous because that becomes your everything. And that's how we, we, can, we can judge or, or tell if, if, if there's an idol kind of creeping in some way into my life, some, something taking the place of God. It's, it's not generally that we're going to have a statue of, of that thing in, in, our, in, our, in our rooms and burn incense to it or like prostrate before it. We tend not to do those kind of things. But it's where we put all of our time. It, that's where our treasure is. That's where our heart is. So while we're waiting for God, we do not want to do what our ancient forefathers uh, in, in just after just being freed from, from, from slavery, what our Hebrew brothers did, and fall immediately into idolatry and put something else in God's place. You've been granted a, a grace to be here for the next couple of days. You're in a place that's I think it looks pretty decent, doesn't it? It looks pretty good. I, not, not just because it's my house, but I think it is. Do you like it? <laughs> Again, don't all answer together. Uh, but it is it's pretty nice. It's, it's a pretty amazing place. Although you're from Athenry, which is nice as well. Uh, but, like, it's a beautiful place. And here, there's no stress, no exams, no pressure. Although I'm, think, I'm re seriously considering having a multiple choice exam after each homily and talk, but we'll see, <laughs> we'll see. Um, so like there's no pressure here. here. Here life is good, your life is really, really good. So while, while we're waiting for God to act, while we're waiting for God in our lives, let us never put anything in his place. And maybe we're waiting for God who has already come. Maybe we're waiting for God who has already come. God was already with the Jews. He was already with them. They were just down at the bottom of the hill. He was at the top of the hill. It wasn't, that, wasn't a million miles away. They just had to wait. He was already with them. So you've come here for a few days of retreat. The Lord is already with you. And over these days, I think in prayer and silence and the different things that we'll be doing, he will reveal himself a little more to you so that you can get to know him, so that you can get to know his heart. So in these days, we ask for an open heart. We ask for that grace to receive God's love. We ask for that grace to, to recognize God when he acts. We, we ask for that grace to, to recognize the hand of God in our lives. The, 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 so often when he has helped us and he has brought us back from a dangerous situation or a sad situation or out of darkness or out of sin, whatever it may be, so often the Lord has already worked in your life. But we ask now for the grace to recognize him, to see him. And that in the meantime, we will never get so impatient that we'll put something else in his place. And so to the prayers and intercession of St. Joachim and Anne, who never met the Lord until Our Lady was born, and then years later, they saw the Savior. They waited and they saw the miracle. So we pray for that grace, for patience, to wait for the Lord until we see him work in our lives. Amen.